Now, flying has long become routine for many people. But even frequent flyers sometimes don't know about things you should never do on a plane. Ooh. No bare feet on a plane. It's one of the biggest no-nos of air travel. Even if we omit the topic of unpleasant odors. Phew. The airplane floor is extremely filthy. People with contagious foot problems might have been walking the aisles barefoot before you. There's likely to be a lot of dirt left after previous passengers. And don't even get me started on the floor in the laboratories. Ew. If your feet need some freedom, take off your shoes, but at least wear your socks. Or bring along a pair of light slippers. Keep in mind that the pressurized air in the passenger cabin is just as dry as it is in the Sahara Desert, with only about 20% humidity. That's why your skin may feel discomfort after a flight. Mm. But wouldn't it make more sense to install several humidifiers that could add some moisture? But this extra load would cost airlines lots of money. Plus, the plane's airframe is mostly made of aluminum and other metals, and humid air could lead to corrosion. So, don't forget to bring a moisturizer and use it during the flight. Always secure your tray table as soon as the plane starts moving on the tarmac, and never lower it during the takeoff and landing. It's a security measure, which ensures that you and the other passengers will have a clear pathway in case of an emergency evacuation. Also, keep your seat in an upright position during takeoff and landing. First of all, a reclined seat can seriously slow down an emergency evacuation, since it will block a person sitting behind. What's more, the more backward you're leaning, the harder it is to get into the brace position during an emergency landing. Now, try to avoid snoozing during or right after takeoff and landing. For one thing, it's not the best thing for your health. The main problem is that the air pressure inside the cabin changes very quickly during these phases of the flight. This, in turn, affects the air pressure in your ears. It's important to be alert during this time to relax and open up your ears. For example, by yawning or swallowing frequency. Chewing gum works for me. If you're sleeping, you can't do this, which can lead to permanent damage. And of course, there's a safety issue. Most accidents happen during takeoff and landing. If you're sleeping during these stages, you might not be alert and conscious enough if an emergency happens. Now, this next recommendation comes from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. According to them, you might want to skip on hot drinks on a plane. The water used to make tea or coffee doesn't come from bottles, it's regular tap water. And water tanks on airplanes are often old and full of bacteria. In 2004, there was a study which found that more than 12% of water samples contained harmful bacteria. But if you still decide to have a cup of hot beverage on a plane, never pour coffee or tea on your own. Flight attendants are trained to handle this task in crowded aisles of a moving airplane and won't accidentally burn you or other passengers. Now, it's probably better if you don't order Coke on a plane. The cabin pressure so low up in the air causes a lot of foam. For apparent reasons, flight attendants don't want to serve you a cup filled with froth. That's why they'll fill only half the cup, then wait for the bubbles to settle, and then finish pouring. That can take ages. Keep your air vent open. This way, you'll minimize the spread of germs. Planes have high-quality air filters. They'll catch up to 99% of all airborne germs, so you should be safe there. But make sure to wipe that tray table. With 8 times more bacteria than the toilet flush button, it's the dirtiest place on board. Another thing you should avoid is leaning your head on the window if you have a window seat. You never know who occupied your seat before you, and in any case, the glass is likely to be covered with germs. Say no to backless sandals and high heels on a flight. I do. There are very serious safety reasons for such a request. The first is that both these types of footwear make it very difficult to evacuate the aircraft fast. If you wear high heels, you will anyway have to leave them behind in case the crew is using emergency slides during an evacuation. The heels are very likely to damage the slide, so off they go. Now ask yourself, do you really fancy running away from the airplane barefoot? I'll answer that for you. Nope. Instead, wear sturdy shoes with a solid sole. In this case, you won't find yourself standing on the hot tarmac or in the weeds without any footwear at all. Don't stuff heavy objects into overhead compartments. Your things may not stay inside during severe turbulence, and while falling out, 
they will injure you and other passengers. Ow! That's why if it feels difficult to lift something into the overhead compartment, better put it under the seat in front of you or elsewhere. Now, don't blame the pilots for the hard landing. When you experience it in bad weather, it might be intentional. If the runway is covered with water or snow, the plane has to touch down hard in order to break the water layer and prevent aquaplaning. Otherwise, the water can perform the role of a lubricant, and the plane won't be able to break or respond to any control. Deploying an emergency slide when there's no emergency is a bad, very bad idea. It can cause hour-long delays and cost airlines thousands of dollars to pack the undamaged slide back into its container. Why would someone do it? Apparently, some think it'll help them get off the plane faster. Well, they're an idiot. Don't be one yourself. Just keep in mind that it doesn't work this way. Don't ignore the instructions of the cabin crew to open window shades during takeoff and landing. This way, flight attendants can see what's happening outside, assess the situation, and act fast, organizing the evacuation. For example, if there's a fire outside one exit, they will redirect passengers toward another door. Avoid carrying spray deodorants or shaving cream in your carry-on baggage. Both these things tend to explode mid-flight and, therefore, aren't allowed on board the airplane. A much better idea is to choose stick deodorants. You also mustn't keep power banks in your checked luggage. And if you want to bring one on board, its capacity shouldn't be more than 20,000 milliamps. Besides, you shouldn't use them during the flight since they might catch fire. In general, lithium batteries are safe to use. But since they're high energy, they can catch fire if they're not treated with care, misused, or if there's a manufacturing fault. Such batteries have been the cause of quite a few fires on board airplanes, as well as during ground handling. Do not worry about airport scanners. They won't harm your health. Otherwise, airport employees wouldn't be able to stay near them without special clothing. Even when you're passing by a baggage scanner, the risk is minimal. And the last one. Don't act like a jerk on board. Behave yourself. I know you will. Also, never try to land a plane on your own. Nah, don't laugh. I'm not kidding. In movies, they often show us that something happens to the pilots and they can't land the plane. And that's when the main character, a very skillful person, starts their game. Unfortunately, it's close to impossible to do it in real life. Even if a person is a genius, is fond of computer simulators that match the real model of an aircraft 100%, and is ready to follow all the instructions from the ground, they're likely to fail due to one simple aspect – stress. It is true that there have been cases throughout history when amateurs landed smallish private planes after the incapacitation of a pilot. However, there has never been a case of a non-professional pilot landing a commercial passenger airplane. It's only in the movies. Are the letters SSSS on your boarding pass a reason to worry? What's much more dangerous than turbulence? Should you really be the first to board the plane? You're about to figure it out. You might have noticed that most planes have blue seats. There's no mystery here. Airlines opt for this color because it's considered to have a calming effect. This color supposedly puts passengers at ease and helps even the most nervous flyers to relax. But there's also another, more practical reason. Stains, dirt, and scrapes are less visible on dark blue fabric. Never throw your boarding pass away in a public place. It contains tons of your sensitive information, including your name and frequent flyer number. This, in turn, may allow someone else to check your future bookings, change your seat, or even cancel your flights. So the best way to deal with the boarding pass for a flight you've already boarded is to take it home and feed it through a paper shredder. By the way, if you ever see the letters SSSS or S on your boarding pass, get ready for additional security checks. Instead of these letters, there may be a checkerboard pattern. Anyway, if you have any of these marks, your carry-on luggage can also undergo a thorough inspection. Why might they choose you for secondary screening? Some of the criteria are making a one-way reservation or paying cash for your ticket. In some cases, the selection is absolutely random. Look, your gate is open and the boarding is started. Wait, where are you running? There's no need to hurry. 
the trick experienced globetrotters use is always board last. For one thing, you don't have to waste time standing in line. Then, there are fewer people on the jetway and in the aisle, and you spend less time on the plane. No one is going to take your seat anyway. There's one exception though. If you have a bulky carry-on bag, it may make more sense not to board last. Otherwise, the chances are high that all the overhead bin space will be occupied by the time you reach your seat. And then your bag may end up in another part of the plane, and you'll have to wait till the other passengers disembark before you get to your luggage. Duh! Before takeoff and landing, flight attendants usually flip a small switch on the bathroom door. This prevents it from flying open when it's not supposed to. With the same ease, a flight attendant can open the door when someone is inside. Look, they only need to lift the lavatory sign and move the knob into the unlocked position. Pilots don't worry about turbulence. That's because they know that there is a thing way more dangerous than any turbulence. It's an updraft. In most cases, turbulence only drops you a couple of feet down, even though it might feel as if you're falling from the top of the Empire State Building. If the turbulence is strong enough for the pilots to ask flight attendants to sit down, the plane can go 10 to 20 feet down. The most extreme white-knuckle turbulence is super rare. But an updraft is a big air mass, part of a storm or some other weather phenomenon, moving upwards. Pilots don't see updrafts on their radars at night, and when a plane hits one, it feels like driving over a huge speed bump at 500 miles per hour. An updraft is also extremely treacherous because it can push an aircraft upward to dangerous altitudes. Modern planes have a special system that detects other aircraft, mountains, and different solid objects in their path. Ten miles away from another plane, and a voice in the cockpit starts chanting, Traffic! Traffic! Five miles closer, and the same voice begins to give pilots the directions. Airplanes can operate with one engine, even during takeoff and landing. Both engines failing simultaneously is almost unheard of. But even then, a plane wouldn't drop from the sky like a rock. Pilots would have up to 20 minutes to find a suitable place to land. The way the cabin is pressurized has a great effect on your taste buds. You lose up to 30% of your ability to taste sweet and salty things. In other words, it's not that airplane food isn't tasty, you just don't feel its flavor. That's also the main reason why airline catering companies add extra salt and spices to the dishes they cook. But you know what may help you? Noise-canceling earphones. For some reason, that probably has a scientific explanation. Cutting off all that noise around can help your taste buds. Each of those dings you hear during the flight has its own meaning. In most airlines, a Boeing soon after takeoff indicates that the landing gear is getting retracted. Three dings in a row means more urgency than just one. A high-low ringtone informs crew members that their colleague needs them in another part of the plane. Three low chimes means some serious turbulence ahead. Crew members are supposed to put away meal carts, take their seats, and fasten their seatbelts. If you're a nervous flyer, pick a seat in the middle of the cabin. Turbulence mostly affects the front and rear parts of the cabin. The middle section, which is over the wings, doesn't shake so much. Pilots and co-pilots eat different meals. The reason for this precaution is very simple. Imagine both pilots having the same dish and getting food poisoning. In this case, neither of them will be able to control the plane. If they still want to have the same dish and won't agree to have anything else, there's a safety net. Pilots don't have their meals at the same time. If one pilot ate the dish and still feels okay several hours later, the other pilot can brave their meal as well. What would you say when asked about the filthiest place on a plane? Nope, that's not the toilet seat. It's not even in the bathroom. Flight attendants warn that you should be particularly careful with headrests, seat pockets, tray tables, and seat belts. Experiments have shown that one-third of all seat belts have yeast and mold on them. Most tray tables are covered with bacteria. Seat pockets are extremely filthy too, but headrests are the dirtiest of them all. In most cases, flight attendants don't have enough time to change or disinfect them in between flights.
If your captain announces they're finishing some paperwork, it means they're busy revising the flight itinerary or waiting for the ground staff to prepare the flight logbook. That's a journal that contains the official record of a journey. Some places, especially those flying long distances, have secret bedrooms for crew members to catch some shut-eye. These bedrooms, called crew rest compartments, are located either at the back of the plane or behind the cockpit. Such a compartment can have up to 10 comfortable beds where flight attendants can have a rest. Plane windows are made of super strong plexiglass that can easily cope with high speeds. And the window panes are shaped in a special way so that the high pressure inside the cabin pushes them against the aircraft body. In other words, plane windows are very unlikely to get broken. Once upon a time, plane windows were square, but the pressure built up in the corners of such windows, making them ultimate weak spots. This means that each square window had four weak spots. This made them likely to crash under the enormous stress of high altitudes. Luckily, making airplane windows curved solved this problem once and forever. Such a shape distributes the pressure and reduces the likelihood of cracks or any other damage. Planes regularly get struck by lightning at least once a year or once per 1,000 hours of flight time. These days, it's totally safe. The electric charge simply runs through the aircraft's aluminum shell. It doesn't cause the plane any damage. But did you know that airplanes not only get hit by lightning, but they also trigger it? When an aircraft is flying through a cloud, the friction between its fuselage and the air creates static electricity. Sometimes, it can cause lightning. Ah yes, everyone loves a holiday. But figuring out what to pack in your luggage can be a daunting task, especially when you're limited on weight and baggage space. Not to mention, you're likely to do some holiday shopping on your adventure away from home. So, you're going to need extra space on your return for all those souvenirs you've collected. Accumulating too much weight or bulk can end up costing you a handsome fee with the airline if you're not properly prepared. But you can now relax. You just focus on booking your vacation. We'll take care of your luggage with these handy traveling tips. No doubt your clothes are going to take up the bulk of your luggage. Considering most airline standards permit one bag for most local trips and up to two bags for longer distances, that doesn't grant you a whole lot of space if you plan on being fashionable on your getaway, especially in the winter. However, this doesn't mean you have to turn your undergarments inside out for repeated use. The key here is to be clever with how you pack. Firstly, you might want to consider how you're folding your clothes. The most space-efficient method to store your wardrobe in a suitcase for travel is to roll up each item. Think of your clothes like those sleeping bags you used to take on your camping trips. They always seem too thick for their compacted covers, but with perseverance, you could roll it up tight enough to fit inside. Now, you don't need to wrestle with your clothes quite as much, but the same principle here applies. Start by folding your shirts, pants, and whatever else you plan on packing neatly, similar to how you might find them on a clothing store shelf. Then, when you have them in a relatively rectangular or squared off shape, roll them up tightly. Now that you have your little clothes logs, start packing them into your bag. And behold, extra space. Now, here's something we've all experienced arriving at our holiday destination. We drop our suitcase on the hotel bed, open it up, only to find all our clothes unfurled and scattered like a tornado stormed through our bag. Your luggage has had a rough journey from your home to your holiday destination. It's been dragged through airport terminals, tossed around by baggage handlers, and rocked back and forth during in-flight turbulence. A simple stationary item Rubber bands will help you keep your clothes neat. Now that you've got them rolled up, place a couple of rubber bands around them to keep them from unfurling. This is an especially neat trick if you want to roll an outfit together as one. Maybe you've got head-to-toe denim that you can't wait to rock on your getaway. Fold up your clothes as before, then layer the different items of your ideal outfit atop each other. Roll them up as one, then use the rubber bands to keep them together. You can preemptively decide your day-to-day -day outfits before you even board the plane. However, you may still prefer to fold your clothes, especially business or formal shirts and pants. Lucky for you, we have a handy trick for that, too. 
Instead of folding each item individually, we're going to lay it out all on top of each other. Start with your shirts and tops, alternating with one on top and one on the bottom, keeping the necks of your shirts at the center. Work your way down to your pants and smaller items until they're all laid out flat. Try to keep your pants in the middle. Finally, start folding your items in on themselves, with the shirts creating the outer layer, until you end up with a neat bundle, like a present. You should be able to sit your bundle squarely into your bag. Want to save even more luggage space? Instead of putting your undergarments and socks into their own section, try fitting them into available spaces and gaps within the rest of your luggage. If you plan on taking a cap with you, for instance, the inside of your headwear is a great space to store your socks. This applies to other small luggage items too, such as phone chargers and ties. Though keep in mind that you can also lay your ties and belts out flat across the clothes in your luggage to conserve space. And if you're really limited on baggage size, say all you have is a carry-on for a fortnight long trip, here's another method. Get yourself some compression bags to store your clothes in. These bags will compact multiple sets of clothes into the size of a small laptop bag. Fold up the clothes you intend to pack and store them into the compression bag. You should be able to fit 8 to 10 standard clothes items or a few bulky ones. Once you've filled the bag, seal it and squeeze the air out through the built-in one-way pressure valve. The easiest way to do this is either by rolling it, and you should be pretty good at rolling your clothes by now, or by using your knees to apply pressure. You should be able to fit two to four of these compression bags in your standard carry-on suitcase, which is especially helpful if you want to save money by avoiding checked-in luggage. And you can take even more clothes on board with you if you stick them into a pillowcase. The best thing about this tip is that it also doubles as a comfy pillow for you to rest your head on during the flight. If you do have a bit more space to spare, another great way to keep your stuff organized is with packing cubes. It might not be as space efficient as compression bags, but a lot of travelers prefer them for tidier and well-organized packing. You might like to divide them by outfits or clothes types, such as one for pants and one for tops. You can easily purchase packing cubes from most online retail services and travel and camping stores. There are also packing cubes specially designed for one or more pairs of shoes. This is a great way to compact the space your shoes would otherwise take up in your luggage and to keep your clean clothes from coming into contact with your footwear. Nobody wants their tops to smell like feet, right? If you're still struggling to bring all your items with you inside your suitcase, there are a couple more tricks that you can use for that extra bit of weight without the extra cost. The most obvious of which is to use your own body. <laughs> That's right, time to layer up. Pick out all your bulky items and wear as many as you can manage. You can try wearing some shorts under your pants or several layers of your winter wear, such as your sweater, jacket, and coat all over the top of one another. You might be sweating a little, but most airports and planes are well air conditioned. You can always shed some layers once you've boarded your flight. At least you'll have some warm wear to snuggle up in if you do get cold up there in the clouds. If you don't want to wear all those layers, there's actually another type of bag you can carry on the plane with you, free of charge. Get yourself a duty-free bag from any of the duty-free stores in the airport. You can even hang on to it for next time. Store all your extra items in your duty-free bag and carry it onto your flight at no additional cost. It's also worth considering what type of luggage you're using. More importantly, how much it weighs. A lot of people forget that the standard 15 pounds permitted by most airlines includes the actual weight of their suitcase. The bag itself can often weigh up to four to six pounds. That's a huge chunk of your weight in the bag alone. So when you're shopping for your luggage, take into account how much it weighs. Choosing a lighter bag will give you more space for the items you want to take with you. Stick to some of these handy tips and you'll be on your way with no shortage of luggage and some extra money to spend on your vacation. Happy flying! That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.